But unless somebody tells me that, I'm going to assume we're pretty good to go. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, start off with today before getting in the content, and this is what I've increasingly been doing at the beginning of these sessions, uh, is to start off with a link to something that's interesting or relevant. Today's link is something uh, that I think many folks uh, may appreciate or be interested in. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, back in LA uh, in early January briefly for an event at the um, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Uh, not a place I've actually ever been before, uh, but the occasion is a series that they're doing uh, called Beware the Elements. Essentially, uh, they're uh, going through a bunch of classic Hollywood disaster movies and having conversations with scientists following them. So there's both a viewing of the movie uh, and then a discussion afterward on, on a wide range of topics. Exactly uh, what topics are still TBD, uh, but I'll be there uh, on January, evening of January 4th, following a viewing of the movie Twister, which I thought was especially appropriate since it is one of my favorite movies and it is sort of infamous in meteorological and atmospheric science circles as being something that was uh, culturally significant enough to shift uh, a, a lot of people uh, who, who grew up with that film and even in the decade or so following it into the field of meteorology. So it, it, there's a little bit of a, of a self-reinforcing feedback there where the movie itself uh, changed the field that it was uh, sometimes loosely based on, although I will say that some of those special effects are uh, very realistic and hold up even today. So if you want to see a conversation uh, following that movie, uh, in including some broader thoughts on climate and extreme weather in popular media in, in, in the context of a warming climate, uh, join me then. This event is actually open to the public uh, and tickets are, are pretty accessible. Uh, so um, there's a link in the comments section. Um, you can read more uh, and uh, hopefully I'll see you there. Um, a programming note for today, if I seem a little bit low energy, uh, well, the, that's not just uh, perception. Uh, the, uh, I think there's, um, I was at uh, the American Geophysical uh, Union all, all of last week, which is always a very intense period. Um, I'm hoping I'm not fighting a, a virus uh, I brought home. So if I, if I feel a little energy, you see me drinking. Uh, taking these pauses to drink green tea. I have not abandoned you, but I might just be taking it a little slower than usual. I see there's a couple of people saying the volume's low, some people saying it's perfect. Uh, unless there's a consensus, I can always raise it a little bit. Um, let me just raise it a little bit to make it, well, that's pretty much where it needs to be. So um, my advice to folks is perhaps just turn up your device slightly. Okay, uh, so there are actually a lot of people on this one, which is an interesting pattern I've noticed where whenever Southern California is going to see a significant rainfall event, the viewership on this channel skyrockets, um, which is not too surprising, of course, because there's a lot of interest in that, and it's somewhat unusual, especially on the heels of a dry autumn. But right now, that's exactly uh, what looks like it's going to happen, is that Southern California is going to get a major storm, particularly... Uh, the southern parts of the central coast, so Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, as well as parts of, of I guess, depending on your definition, uh, uh, deep southern California, uh, Los Angeles County uh, as well. Really anywhere where there are north-south oriented uh, mountain slopes, which is of course true across the entire transverse range, which goes largely from west to east from the central coast into the interior parts of southern California, as well as some other smaller peaks and ranges south of that. These are places that are going to potentially see some very heavy rainfall later this week, but also uh, some of the urban corridor may see unusually intense precipitation from a storm like this, and I'll get into the details about why a little bit later. So let me back up a moment and just talk about the weather that we've been seeing recently. Uh, no, it's been really dry and warm. It's been balmily warm and unusually dry for really throughout the state the past couple of weeks. Uh, temperatures even right now are, even though it has started raining in northern central, central California, excuse me, they're still in the 60 to 70 degree Fahrenheit range. That is extraordinarily warm for a rainy day in mid to late December in northern and central California. There, there, I can probably count on one hand the number of 
winter rain days that have been that warm across such a wide region. So this is not typical. And the even more remarkable thing is it's not going to go away. These systems will continue to be pretty warm and the temperatures won't drop that much uh, as these systems move in. The second system does look a little bit colder, at least on the backside, but in general, these are, these are exceptionally warm and moist subtropical origin air masses that are being entrained into these systems. And for this reason, in the Sierra Nevada, snow levels have been extremely high. It's been raining for much of the past couple days at Donner Summit even. So the, the Central Sierra Snow Lab is reporting that whatever minimal snow is on the ground, a lot of it has melted because they've been getting rain on top of it. The good news is that's not really a flood risk right now because there hasn't been that much snow on the ground to melt. So there's not really a great deal of additional water to be added to the, the watersheds from that snow melt, but it is an indication this is an unusually warm storm. And that this, this year is very different from last year in that regard. These are not unusually cold storms, but in fact, unusually warm storms. Notably, that is something that had been an early prediction about this winter, was that although there being some uncertainty about precipitation, whatever storms we do get, we're much more likely to be warm storms with very high snow levels, rather than persistent, very cold uh, storms bringing lots of snow like we did last year. So that certainly seems to be true with the first big systems of the year occurring first, uh, already ongoing and just in the past couple of days across Northern California, and then to come in the next 48 hours across Southern California. These look like storms that will have very high snow levels, especially to begin with, well above past level, not, especially in Southern California. This is not really going to be a mountain snow kind of storm. It's going to be a very warm rain instead. Um, also, there have already been significant thunderstorm uh, activity in, in central and northern California, especially out over the open ocean, but also over land. Uh, this has now been a feature of these systems this year. The one cutoff low in October, that was pretty uh, chock full of lightning up in northern California, as well as being wet. This storm, again, uh, is very convectively unstable, and I'll show, uh, I'll, in fact, maybe I will actually bring that up on screen since I'm set up to share uh, some satellite imagery. Uh, so uh, you should see that momentarily. And I'm just gonna leave that up while I talk about the current system. Uh, this is uh, essentially uh, what the system that was departing was a, known as a cutoff low pressure system, meaning that it is cut off from the strong west to east flow of the jet stream, and so isn't moving quickly. The storm that's replacing it is, you guessed it, another cutoff low. So all of the three most significant storms so far this season will be a cutoff lows of different character. All of them have been relatively warm and unstable. So that means that they are not good snow producers. In fact, they're actually quite poor snow producers. But the trade-off is that uh, there is a little bit less of an orographic influence. So these storms, you can kind of see, even in the satellite imagery, the bubbliness of the clouds, of these convective clouds swirling around the low. There really isn't a well-defined cold front per se, but there certainly is uh, some subtle frontal features, but more importantly, these swirling bands of puffy cumulus clouds bringing bands of sometimes heavy showers and uh, embedded thunderstorms. That's been the pattern already across northern and central California from the previous system for the past few days. This next system is going to dive further south and affect central and southern California more directly. In fact, it may be more intense and slower moving than the storms we've seen recently. So this may actually have quite significant storm related impacts in southern California with at least uh, localized regions of very heavy rainfall and torrential thunderstorm downpours and potentially flash flooding and debris flows. Uh, and so the Weather Service has issued flash flood watches across all, essentially, of Southern California. Uh, the risk will be highest in the usual spots, the very steep slopes of the transverse ranges and the flashy watersheds and creeks that run down them, as well as recent burn areas. There aren't a lot of them this year, but there are some, including a fire that burned in Ventura County. Again, not huge, but a few thousand acres. Uh, I think it was either just last week or the week before. So that the recency of those burn areas, even though they weren't extremely intense or large fires, could cause localized problems. But as I mentioned, the interesting thing about this storm and the one that preceded it is that the downpours might occur anywhere. They will not be quite as tied to mountains. So the orographic mountain lifting of, of the air mass to produce, uh, squeeze out that rainfall, this system will be less dependent on that. So there might be less of a steep gradient between the coast and the inland mountain areas in terms of rainfall than there would normally be. Sometimes during a strong atmospheric river event in Southern California, uh, 
the coastal areas might see an inch or two of rain, whereas the, the wettest peaks, say, in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties could see 15 or 20 inches of rain, so something like a tenfold differential. In this storm, I don't think it'll be that high. I think the extremes will be a little bit less extreme in the mountains, but probably significantly higher in the more densely populated uh, coastal and urban areas at lower elevations. And so, even, so in some ways, this might be a higher impact storm precisely because it won't be associated with a particularly intense atmospheric river, maybe a weak to moderate one. But it's important to remember that cutoff low pressure systems uh, in Southern California are actually responsible for some of the most extreme precipitation events uh, and, um, and flash flood events. So unlike in Central and Northern California, where almost all the big flood events come from either one big atmospheric river or a sequence of strong atmospheric rivers, in Southern California, some of the big one-off rain and extreme precipitation events actually do come from these convectively unstable cutoff lows. And that's because cutoff lows are slow moving. They can sometimes entrain a fair bit of moisture like this one will. They tend to be a little bit more unstable. So there can be some convective activity in the air mass, these taller cumulus clouds that can cause very high rain rates that over localized areas that can train or move repeatedly over the same location. But more importantly is it means that there's a long fetch of uh, conditionally unstable and very moist Pacific air that moves perpendicular to the primary axis of topography in Southern California for many, many hours or even days at a time. In other words, south to north flow, if you've got a east to west oriented mountain, mountain range, is at a 90 degree angle. It's orthogonal to the mountain range. That's the ideal flow pattern to squeeze out a lot of that moisture. And if it's a cutoff low, this isn't a very rapid moving cold front where you get a burst of heavy rain and then it just sort of fades away afterward. If you get it at one of these bands of showers and thunderstorms, it sets up over the same portion of the east to west facing slopes in Southern California and just sits there for hours as appears to be possible with the system you can get a, a, a pretty significant uh, flash flood event. So the Weather Prediction Center from NOAA is now highlighting southern uh, portions of Southern California, especially Santa Barbara, Ventura, and portions of Los Angeles counties, although also elsewhere, as being at a, a, a fairly significant, so they, they call it moderate risk, which is actually a fairly high risk designation because there is only one higher risk designation. There's only one level above moderate, and that is high risk of flash flooding tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, and in this case, I think there is some potential for that to happen outside of the mountains, again, because of these slow moving, uh, heavy convective shower and thunderstorm bands that might repeatedly move over the same areas. This system is moving over water that is unusually warm. The near shore ocean waters are as much as three to five degrees Fahrenheit above average along the California coast. That's a big number. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, to heat the ocean by an extra few degrees. And so we're three to five degrees Fahrenheit above average. That is exerting a noticeable influence on the instability and the warmth of the storms we're seeing this season. It is contributing to why uh, they have been warm and wet rather than cold and snowy. It is also contributing to why we're seeing so much thunderstorm activity. Each Again, each of the systems this fall have been associated with thunderstorms. That's not so common for California historically. It happens occasionally, but usually not with every storm. So that is not notable, and this will be a particularly important in Southern California uh, with the upcoming event. And again, this won't be a quick moving storm. This is going to linger through perhaps Friday, but certainly uh, Wednesday and Thursday will be very wet in portions of Southern California. Far Southern uh, California, so thinking San Diego County, still going to get some rain, but it might not be as heavy or as intense as further north. But right now, the bullseye of the storm really does look like to be the southern portions of the central coast and the northern po portions of the urban corridor of Southern California. So again, uh, primarily Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties, although adjacent areas will be affected too. The not to be left out, coastal uh, Northern California will also, will also get a nice burst of rain with this. In fact, even in parts of the San Francisco Bay Area, it could see a period of uh, a persistent heavy rain band with some embedded thunderstorms tonight into tomorrow that could bring some local flooding issues there as well. The difference is the watersheds in the Bay Area are much more capable of accommodating those sorts of rains. And also there tend not to be as many mountains uh, that are east-west oriented in the Bay Area. 
So there's only localized areas that have that kind of top topographical influence. So, so this significant rain is likely again tomorrow into the Bay Area, maybe some localized flooding, but no major flooding, no river flooding up there. The Sierra Nevada will continue to see relatively warm showers, although there might be periods where the snow level line mixes down a little bit farther down the mountain than in the recent storms, since there's a bit of cold air wrapping around the back end of this. But the bullseye really does appear on this one to be in Southern California, which in some ways is good because it's been very dry there. This will be uh, a pretty El Nino flavored storm. I don't usually like to talk about El Nino in terms of individual storm systems, but in this context, I think it's appropriate because this is a warm, wet system that is at least indirectly being caused by a very strong zonal extension of the jet stream across the entire North Pacific. It's not directly impinging on California right now, of course, because this is a cutoff low and it's cut off from the mean flow, meaning the jet stream isn't making it all the way to California. But if you zoom out, there is an unusually strong subtropical jet streak. And that is a classical El Nino flavored pattern. It's one of the reasons why this system will be have some decent dynamics when it moves into Southern California, why it's being supplied with a, a rich uh, source of subtropical moisture, and why it's going to have some nice upward vertical motion and diffluent region on the east side of the low, all of which is going to be to a fairly significant storm in Southern California. So don't write this one off. I would not be surprised to see some fairly significant flash flooding in portions of Southern California tomorrow or Thursday, and possibly a little bit outside of the usual region. So some urban flooding and creek flooding and freeway flooding, that's certainly also possible with this event, because there will be localized uh, heavy thunderstorm downpours uh, in Southern California with this one as well. The other thing about this warmth, as I mentioned, is that it's not really snowing in the mountains. And it's, it's I mean, the snowpack is very low or even non-existent in many areas. I'm not sure how much this system is going to help. It's gonna bring, bring a lot of rain to some places, not a lot of snow, except at extremely high elevations. We're talking like nine or 10,000 feet, and there aren't too many places in California above nine or 10,000 feet. There may be some colder storms to follow this one though. Uh, so after this event, it looks like there's going to be um, more active weather to come. There might be a break for a few days following this one, which frankly will be a good thing in Southern California because it's going to be very wet indeed. Uh, but by the middle of next week, that Pacific jet actually does look like it's going to make it all the way to the West Coast, uh, sort of landfalling somewhere near Central to Northern California, and that's likely going to drive a series of more traditional atmospheric river storms. They may be a little bit colder too, probably not really cold, but colder than these very warm subtropical systems we're seeing now, and they have the potential to bring significant rain and wind to the west coast. It's not entirely clear what latitude they're going to make landfall on the west coast, but it could very well be central or northern California. So there could be the potential for major storm activity next week and the following week, although the models show a wide range of potential outcomes in their respective ensembles, all the way from slightly wet conditions to extremely wet conditions that would cause significant flood risk. So uh, again, uh, uncertainty in what comes next, but it looks like an active and wet pattern is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. This week in particular, it looks like Southern California is finally going to get its fair share after a very dry start to the season. In fact, I would expect a lot of areas might be back to or above seasonal averages uh, five days from now because some spots will easily see three to six inches of rain in Southern California, even on the coastal plain in some spots before all is said and done this week. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this uh, satellite image because it's not evolving that quickly. I think you get the idea. It's not quite like radar. You'll see, uh, see me again on screen. Uh, what you didn't see is me taking lots of sips of tea. Uh, so I think what's interesting about all of this is how, you know, we had a really dry and warm fall, record warm and dry fall in some parts of the American West. And this is shaping up to be the warmest December on record for a lot of the US. So actually it's not just California, uh, Sierra Nevada is seeing a bad snow uh, season so far, but it's really everyone in uh, continental North America. Uh, so this is, in, in a lot of ways, I, I want to point out that this start to the season is very much a preview of what I think the future will often look like in a warming climate in California, specifically uh, a pretty dry uh, autumn 
uh, with uh, warmer ocean temperatures, creating sort of mild conditions. Um, December is a bit of a wild card, as I think it's going to continue to be moving into the future. But then as we shift from December to January, uh, conditions actually getting quite wet, but not necessarily cold. And not every uh, season will necessarily be characterized by warm subtropical systems like this year so far has, but that will be increasingly the flavor. We will see years where come mid-December, the, the snow conditions in the Sierra are pretty abysmal. And again, last year was exactly the opposite of that, but I think that is going to be a dramatic exception relative to what we should expect. So this year is probably closer to it. Uh, but notably, after this week, California will not be dry uh, anymore, despite the seasonal start. And that increasing sharpness between dry autumns, hot summers, this summer was not particularly hot, so that's a bit different. Uh, but between uh, potentially hot summers, uh, dry autumns, and then potentially even wetter, warmer winters, in many cases, uh, is very much a signature of what we expect many future years to look like. So if you don't like the way this year has progressed, I have some not so great news for you about the next couple of decades. Um, of course, lots of variability year to year, but this is the kind of thing that, that we would expect to see. Not seasons that are just totally bone dry throughout. Seasons that start dry but then get really wet and perhaps get a little bit too wet too quickly. We still could see that this year, and the seasonal outlook still tilts towards wetter than average conditions in January through March. Again, that's just a tilt in the odds. El Nino, strong, even a strong one, it's verging on historically strong. In fact, that we may get there yet. Doesn't tell us everything we need to know, but it does tilt the odds, despite what some folks have been saying recently. I really don't know why they're doing it. Uh, but the evidence does show that strong east-based El Ninos are essentially predictive of shifts in the atmospheric state over the North Pacific that do favor wetter winters across central and southern California and parts of the interior southwest. But they also, especially in a warming climate, are going to increasingly favor relatively warm conditions, so potentially warmer wetter conditions. Higher confidence in the warm, lower confidence in the wet. Uh, and that is indeed exactly what we're seeing right now as you go from a warm and dry pattern to a warm and wet pattern in California. At least there's going to be water, uh, but there won't necessarily be great snow. And I would not be too surprised if Sierra snowpack as of January 1st is alarmingly low. It'll probably be higher than it is now. I do think there'll be some colder storms, but we've really lost you know, the, the window up to the present. We're probably going to lose another week, and there's no obviously very cold storms going to come along and really boost it at, at low to medium elevations. Again, if you've got some mountain peaks up at 9, 10,000 feet, they may be doing fine, but that's not a very large portion of the broader watershed. So. Uh, so again, just to recap, the warm and unstable air mass that was in Northern California will spread southward uh, as a second cutoff flow makes it uh, dives down the coast, potentially setting up a significant risk of flash flooding and debris flows in certain parts of Southern California and portions of the Central Coast, particularly along the transverse ranges, uh, but maybe also up into Monterey County, Big Sur Coast, uh, that area as well. Uh, I know there's a lot of anticipation um, the Highway 1 area along the Big Sur Coast because Caltrans has, is ramping up some of their uh, very major construction or reconstruction projects following the last couple of, of dramatically wet winters. Um, I don't know if this event is necessarily going to test them severely, but it's, there's at least a chance that it will. Uh, systems later this year might do um, a more robust job of testing those uh, new uh, drainage uh, systems and, and landslide uh, mitigation measures, so we'll see. Uh, but again, in Southern California, this is going to be a pretty dramatic shock. It's been really dry and kind of mild and warm for months, and we're going to get slammed again. So ironically, we sort of went from midsummer extreme precipitation event with Tropical Storm Hillary, remember that one, uh, really pretty dry and fairly quiescent period, warm some fire weather, but no extreme fires, and then uh, transitioning right to a potentially significant flood event uh, in some areas um, almost overnight. Again, increasing hydroclimate whiplash with warming, a flavor of the future. Um, so I think that's uh, actually what I wanted to cover uh, in the monologue portion uh, of this conversation. 
Uh, I'm actually now going to take a look at the comments since I want to answer questions. So uh, bear with me uh, as I uh, as I go through the uh, the comment section. Uh, you may see an ad uh, as this pauses, but uh, rest assured, I'm going to come back momentarily once I've started to uh, get to some of the good questions that I can answer in just a minute. So. Uh, brief commercial break here. I'm also going to take a sip of tea. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with me there. So there are a lot of people asking general questions about specific models and what's going to happen after the next seven to ten days. Uh, and that's always, a, of course, a trickier proposition. That's when we get into probabilistic uh, outlook territory rather than deterministic. So uh, tilts in the odds versus looking at specific storms that far out. There is uh, what is known as a broad dispersion within the ensembles right now, so there are a wide range of plausible solutions. One of the reasons for this is that the extremely intense and eastward extended Pacific jet that, that by late December will likely extend clean across the Pacific and all the way to California, at least briefly, uh, will then once again begin to retract uh, westward. But that is not necessarily bad news uh, because sometimes if it retracts only uh, 500 to 1,000 miles, as a lot of the model numbers suggest it will, that actually puts California in a favorable place uh, to be the recipient of what's known as Rosby wave breaking. So as the jet uh, tails off a little bit west of California, it kind of spins off uh, tendrils of a cyclonic vorticity and jet energy. Uh, think of sort of a, a, a garden hose or a fire hose flailing around uh, in a very wavy, sort of erratic pattern. It, it's not necessarily aimed at any one place for a prolonged period of time, uh, but if you happen to get blasted in the face, uh, it's it's a real powerful, uh, it's a real powerful feeling. That might be what the jet stream ends up doing as as a as a partial jet retraction occurs uh, in early heading into early January, and that will favor cyclonic wave breaking probably and the formation of significant atmospheric rivers that make landfall somewhere along the west coast. The latitude is a little bit uncertain. Some model members suggest it'll be more in the Pacific Northwest, but others really do suggest it'll be aimed more squarely right at California. So the pattern heading into early January looks like one that has, has a pretty high probability of being wet to very wet for central and northern California. It might not quite be as favorable for Southern California as the next seven to 10 days will, uh, but we'll see uh, because there is a lot of uncertainty. And then there are indications already in the models that that jet extension might rebuild itself uh, in the subseasonal, looking and heading further into early January. So that, that would restart this whole cycle. In other words, I, it, it does not appear that there is going to be a persistent blocking ridge that, that deflects storms uh, during this period. There might be transient ridges, and there may even be strong ones, but it doesn't look like they're going to last very long. It looks like this will be a pattern that alternates between wetter and drier, and the wets could be very wet. In general, this does not look like a very cold pattern. This continues to look like a warmer than average pattern, although not all individual storms will be warm, and there probably will be at least some storms that are colder, better mountain snow producers than we're seeing right now. That's all I can really say right now because it's a quite a volatile pattern and the strong El Nino forcing will be really exerting its maximum influence starting in the next few weeks and continuing for a couple of months. So this should be the period we would expect to see wetter than average conditions across uh, especially central and southern California, perhaps also northern California, and certainly warmer uh, than average conditions when we do get those storms. But with that we're already seeing, that may continue. Doesn't mean that every storm is going to be warm, but that probably will be the tilt. So that's sort of what I'm foreseeing right now, but there there is of course uh, uncertainty there. All right, let's see. Now several folks uh, commenting 
uh, that yes, confirming that uh, temperatures have been warm, nighttime lows in the mid 50s, daytime highs in the mid to upper 60s, that is indeed very warm for really any part of California during rain events uh, in mid-December. That just is notably warm. There were some chain controls up at Donner Summit briefly, but not because of heavy snowfall, but just because some slush fell, sort of a rain-snow mix that accumulated a little bit. Might be back to rain again. So that's clearly where the snow level is right now. It's a bit lower than it was, but that's still really high. If it's sort of barely rain-snow mixing at Donner Summit, that means that everything below that elevation is probably just still rain. Folks commenting, yeah, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, uh, you know, really feel uh, subtropical, tropical right now. Yeah, I mean, the air mass out there is more characteristic of, uh, say, a mid-elevation Big Island of Hawaii type air mass. This is what you might get uh, in the hills above Hilo or something in December in terms of temperatures in the 60s with occasional downpours. Um, a question uh, from Big Sir Kate. Um, are we considered uh, the southern portion of the central coast? Uh, yes, I would say that, that uh, like coastal Monterey County, Big Sur, and um, the northern coastal part of uh, SLO, I think all of that is in my, uh, my own uh, somewhat arbitrary geographic delineation, the well, I guess that would be the northern central coast, excuse me. So I think that in general, the flood risk from this system will be highest uh, from about Santa Barbara County into LA County, but it'll probably extend up into the Big Sur coast as well, and then maybe southward and eastward further into the transverse ranges of Southern California, Riverside, San Bernardino County mountains maybe as well. So that's sort of this general, it has a lot to do with the orientation of the flow relative to topography. There could be some localized very heavy downpours, Big Sur, but this won't be a storm that maximizes the orogra orographic lift there, but it will be for the transverse ranges of Southern California. Of course, the mountains along Big Sur coast are oriented uh, about north, north-northwest-ish, uh, sort of, sort, sort of uh, oblique, oblique to the cardinal direction. Uh, but of course, for the transverse ranges, they're not quite perpendicular to the mountains along the Big Sur Curse, but almost, they are almost due east to west in some places. And so that greatly affects uh, the orientation of the topography relative to the direction of the mean flow. So really what you want to maximize orographic lifting is usually uh, orthogonal or 90 degree angles. Um, so for the Big Sur Coast, you generally want winds uh, from the southwest or south-southwest to hit the coast mountains at a 90-degree angle. But in Southern California, you actually want winds straight out of the south or even the southeast. Uh, to, to, uh, so there's almost a 90-degree difference there. Well, there's a question from uh, Noe. Uh, why will a warmer climate make autumn drier? Well, there is this is there is evidence for this. It's not slam dunk evidence, but the, certainly this is the the most likely future is that the shoulder seasons in California dry out. So uh, autumn and especially spring, but the winter might get a bit wetter. And the reason for that is that California essentially exists at the margins of the subtropics and the mid-latitudes. And the tropics themselves are literally expanding uh, poleward latitudinally as the Hadley cell, the, the, this broad atmospheric circulation cell, expands in a warming climate. California is effectively at the mercy of the tropics and subtropics during its warm and dry seasons. So historically, that's been the summer. But as the Hadley cell expands, it'll increasingly be uh, into autumn and spring as well. So that will tend to result in more subtropical ridges in autumn and spring, but not necessarily in winter. In fact, still climate models suggest that the opposite might happen in winter. This is one of the reasons why we expect to see such a, an even a, a further increase in the already strong seasonally sharp uh, cycle of California's rainy season with even drier dry periods and even wetter wet periods, not just within seasons and year to year, but also with the seasonal cycle. The summer's already really dry and the winter's usually wet, but the autumn and fall 
excuse me, the autumn and spring can go either way. In a warming climate, we expect that the shoulder seasons will tend to get drier as the storm track preferentially shifts northward in those seasons, but probably does not do so in winter. That is the primary reason. There's also some interesting arguments about the nonlinearity of uh, moisture advection due to land sea uh, temperature contrast. In other words, the land is warming faster than the ocean in a warming climate. And because uh, the, uh, the vapor pressure in the atmosphere, the amount of water vapor that uh, the atmosphere can hold, uh, is an exponential function of temperature, it means that the land, uh, essentially the, the saturation vapor pressure over land increases much faster than over water. What this means is that uh, the, the advection of moisture changes because uh, the atmospheric humidity over land is more at a deficit moving forward. So even a, 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 an increasing amount of moisture over the ocean isn't enough to compensate for the even faster increasing level of uh, moisture deficit over land. And that can set up some interesting things where uh, the, the storm track changes interact with moisture gradient changes in complex ways. Probably a topic that's a little beyond scope for this conversation, but there's some interesting things going on there for sure. A uh, question from Mary. Uh, I, I figured I would get uh, something like this. Um, what are the pictures uh, up behind me uh, and why do you have them up? Well, one of them is probably familiar for those who have seen me uh, on other YouTube sessions or on TV at any point in the last uh, several years. The, the larger uh, photograph at the bottom, all three photographs are, one, are photographs that I've taken within the last decade. The one at the bottom is taken from the top of a sand dune in Death Valley uh, on, in, in mid-August. Now, normally in mid-August, you do not want to be at the top of a sand dune in Death Valley at 2 p.m., which is when this photo was taken, but it was one of the very rare days that was cloudy with light rain in the middle of August. So it was about 80 degrees and raining. So it was, and there was no direct sunlight. So the, the sand dune was like wet, like beach sand. And you could actually walk on it mid afternoon in August with bare feet. So it was kind of an extraordinary experience. That's the view uh, from that sand dune looking east um, from, um, I believe uh, near the, the dunes near Stovepipe Wells. I think that was August, 2014. The other two photographs, uh, the one that appears uh, on uh, camera left, uh, higher above my head, that one is a photograph uh, that I took uh, this past July, in fact, on the 4th of July, uh, in, uh, on the, the plains of eastern Colorado. It's a, it's a supercell thunderstorm with a sculpted uh, lenticular uh, styled uh, mesocyclone. So it was uh, the classic mothership supercell type storm. Um, just an isolated severe thunderstorm it dropped, I think hail the size of someone's fist for a little while. Obviously tried not to be underneath it when it was doing that. The photo on the right is another photograph that I took this past summer. That one is from southeastern Wyoming near the small town of Yoder. Uh, out on near the, the bluffs uh, on the far western fringe of the Great Plains. It's a little bit hard to tell from this distance, but that's a, a, a shot of a, uh, of a mesocyclone uh, underneath a, a rotating supercell thunderstorm. And there's actually, if you could look closely enough, there's a tornado dropping uh, down out of the mesocyclone onto the plains. Um, that was a, a really cool uh, thing to see. That storm actually dropped, I believe, seven different tornadoes, and I think I saw four or five of them, different flavors of tornado from the same storm over about three hours. So I have those photos uh, because I think they're interesting. Uh, they're certainly weather-related, uh, and it is one, a hobby of mine to go try and find interesting uh, meteorological features uh, and capture them on film. So uh, here, uh, up on the, along the front range in Boulder is sort of at the confluence of the Great Plains uh, and the Rocky Mountains. And so um, clash of the air masses is, is not a euphemism around here. Um, and you're within, you're within about an hour's drive of almost any kind of weather you can imagine, depending on the time of year. Uh, so uh, for, for a self-professed weather geek, that's a pretty cool place to be. It is also probably one of the reasons why the National Center for Atmospheric Research is located in Boulder. There are other historical uh, defense contractor reasons why some of these institutions exist where they do, but the other piece of it 
is that the weather um, in, in Boulder and along the front range of, of the Rocky Mountains is just incredibly dramatic, and there is uh, a contingent of atmospheric scientists who like to observe interesting weather, but also it makes studying it in some ways easier because uh, it is possible to do field studies of many different types of phenomena, again, within a couple hours of uh, the NCAR campus. So um, a little bit of a tangent there, but hopefully you enjoy the photos. Uh, by the way, I do now have, um, I had to get an Instagram account to be present on threads. Uh, so I do now have one, weather.west. Um, on Instagram, I, I strictly post uh, meteorological and weather cloud photos. So uh, don't go there for hard-hitting science or technical discussions. But if you do like my uh, my cloud and landscape photography, uh, I, I'll occasionally uh, post it there as well. These ones I don't think are up there yet, but they will be eventually. Ah, okay, let's see. Lots of good questions today, so I'm going to keep going. A question from M. Sargent, how are cutoff lows related to climate change, if they are? Um, that's a good question. The most honest answer is we don't really know. There isn't a clear quantitative trend, nor is there a clear theoretical expectation. But there's a good chance they are actually re related to climate change. Not that there are anything new under the sun. There have been cutoff lows for as long as the Earth has had uh, an atmosphere that chemically resembles its current state, which is to say for millions and millions of years. But you know, where cutoff lows tend to preferentially form, how long they stick around, that could be something that is influenced by climate change. And it's an interesting question because in some places there is now some evidence that certain kinds of persistent weather patterns, mainly in Northern Hemisphere summer, might be coming more frequent uh, in association with warming and that the jet stream may be changing in a way that, that sort of favors these stagnant and stuck weather patterns. So often and during those stagnant and stuck weather patterns, Within the trough, you can tend to get uh, essentially what becomes a cutoff low um, in between the ridges. So you can get extreme heat waves and drought and fire events in the, in the ridges of these stuck patterns, and you tend to get uh, unstable cutoff lows in between, and that results in extreme precipitation and flooding sometimes. This is actually what we saw across the Mediterranean this summer, which went from extreme wildfire and extreme record heat, which is pretty suddenly, excuse me, to uh, extreme precipitation and flooding thanks to some cutoff lows. Um, it is more of a summer thing that we're seeing and California doesn't really get cutoff lows in summer so not totally clear what that might mean for uh, California in terms of cutoff lows and again there's no real research on this but it is plausible maybe that the flavor of whatever precipitation that we do receive in autumn and spring again in the shoulder seasons that I mentioned earlier uh, where the storm track is preferentially and therefore the jet stream might be further north than it used to be in those months that whatever does sneak in might be more likely to be a cutoff low. So it might be that most of the time it rains less in autumn and spring, but when it does rain, it pours uh, potentially because these cutoff lows, if they do entrain in subtropical moisture or they do sit over the same region of, for a long time, or they are unusually convective, uh, convectively unstable in producing thunderstorms, they can produce significant amounts of precipitation, especially in Southern California. So all of that is um, bonus informed speculation that you get uh, from uh, me personally by uh, joining this session, because frankly, there are no research studies on this, except for the, the summer persistent weather pattern and jet stream changes over the Northern Hemisphere. There is some uh, scholarship now coming out on that but in terms of California or cutoff lows generally, uh, the the main answer is we don't know. But uh, subject to the inter potentially interesting caveats I just mentioned. A question, uh, what will this summer be like as El Nino fades? Well, there's a high likelihood of El Nino uh, crashing by spring and into summer, and we're flipping right back into La Nina. So uh, the summer could be characterized more by La Nina conditions. Uh, that would then likely persist into fall, maybe next winter. It's a little bit too far out to say anything beyond that, uh, but you know it does look pretty likely that following a very strong El Nino event, which again is what we're experiencing right now, it is not at all unexpected to then um, slip back into co uh, really cooling of the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean and La Nina. What is interesting, though, is that the seasonal models are showing 
historically unprecedented combination of La Nina conditions later uh, in, in the spring and next summer. Again, it's early, but they're showing that the eastern tropical Pacific will cool to La Nina levels, as would be expected following a strong El Nino event most of the time, but that the extra tropics, the area outside the tropics, will remain extremely warm. So the mid-latitude oceans, just like this year, was a historically unprecedented combination of extremely uh, warm uh, El Nino waters and non-El Nino uh, temperate waters. Next year might be a historically unprecedented uh, combination of record warm temperate waters and more typical uh, cool La Nina waters. That could result in different atmospheric patterns than we're used to with La Nina. One thing it very likely is to do is to supercharge the Atlantic hurricane season next year. So um, plans in Florida or in the Gulf Coast, watch out for that. Uh, beyond that, it's a bit difficult to say, but um, it could get interesting because once again, we may have an unusual novel even combination of conditions. And it's quite likely that 2024, the calendar year, uh, will be even warmer globally than 2023 was because a lot of El Nino's warmth in the atmosphere lags uh, that warmth in the ocean. So a lot of it's going to come out of the atmosphere between now and March or April. A uh, question from Patrick, what drives the jet retraction and rebuilding? There's a number of processes. Uh, I talked about uh, East Asia mountain torque uh, and the cross barrier flow as a mechanism, a cold air mass that's sort of spilling out from the Tibetan plateau as a mechanism for a jet extension. It's fairly technical. Uh, essentially, the mechanism for retraction is almost the opposite, is that cold air is no longer present. It's no longer spilling perpendicular to the Himalayan uh, mountains and falling off the Tibetan plateau where we don't have that influence anymore, um, that might be partially responsible for a retraction. There's also some degree of tropical forcing. So the Madden Julian oscillation, I haven't looked extremely closely at what the subseasonal forcing would be for this particular event, uh, but that's one thing that will be happening is that the, essentially the, the thing that makes the jet extend is weakening and so it won't extend as much as, as you might expect. A uh, comment from uh, Noe, hopefully I'm getting the the, the name right. Uh, here in Mammoth Lakes, it has been mostly rain in town. And that is notable because, of course, Mammoth Lakes is at like 8,000 feet. Oh, yeah, 8,000 feet uh, elevation. So at least in the eastern Sierra, the snow level has been at or above 8,000 feet. That's very high. So it's really only snowing at very high elevations for the most part. Yeah, a uh, question about uh, wh what are my thoughts for snowfall in the southern Sierra Nevada over the next 10 days? Well, again, this is going to depend largely on elevation. If you can manage to be up at nine or 10,000 feet, maybe you'll get some great snowfall. But at more typical elevations down at four, five, 6,000 feet, this does not look like a good snow pattern. There might be some snow down to closer to five or 6,000 feet um, at the back end of this pattern as things cool down, but it just does not really look like a great snow accumulation pattern unless you're at, you know, near the mountain peaks where it's almost always cold enough for snow, even in a warming climate. All right, well, um, got about 10 minutes uh and there is i think i've gotten through most of the questions so i'll leave it uh i'll leave the questions open for another couple minutes here for any uh last minute stragglers and then i'm just going to summarize um uh, what's what's uh, coming down the pike since i know some of you uh, joined a little bit later than others uh particularly because there is a potentially quite significant weather event wednesday or thursday in southern california uh, so I may, I'm going to pause, take a quick sip of tea, you might see another ad, and then I'm going to do one more round of looking at questions and then do a quick overview, uh, recap of everything. So bear with me for a moment.
All right, well, not too many new questions rolling in, so if they do, I'll answer them at the very end. But just a quick recap uh, of what's going on in California. The uh, You may have noticed, you've likely noticed, uh, that it's unusually warm, given that it is raining in many places, so it is muggy, subtropical. That is because this is a muggy, subtropical air mass, but also because the near shore waters off the coast of California are anywhere from 3 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit above average. That is really, really warm, and actually technically qualifies as a marine heat wave, according to NOAA's definition. Uh, so that is that that is a pretty significant effect. It's making the storms warmer. It's increasing snow levels. It's probably increasing the amount of moisture in the lower levels of the atmosphere, at surface temperatures, and maybe convective instability. So it might also be describing why we're seeing these bubbly cumulus clouds and thunderstorms, preferentially with these recent systems. That's likely to continue with this next storm, that's uh, going to dive further south, another cutoff low that's going to persist for a couple of days and affect mainly Southern California. Again, the ra rainfall will be heaviest probably uh, from about Santa Barbara County eastward into Los Angeles County, but there will be significant and locally intense downpours as far north as the San Francisco Bay Area and all the way down to San Diego. There is a significant risk of flash flooding, especially in the transverse ranges, but also in some of the lower lower elevation urban areas in Southern California from this, because this will be a little bit less of an orographically uh, dependent system than usual. You'll get some thunderstorm downpours. It'll reach all the way down to sea level. So uh, an inch in an hour is possible just about anywhere. That's a very high rainfall rate, a significant risk of urban flash flood, debris flow type concerns even though it's been really dry leading up to this event because the hourly rainfall rates could be quite significant. Uh, and then uh, after that, it looks like the active pattern is going to continue. I don't see any obvious optimal pattern for lots of snow accumulation, although storms will probably be not as warm, and so the ski resorts might finally get to see some snow at least, although I think that it's going to be touch and go for a while still because there's not a good base to build on. It's been warm in the antecedent conditions, and again, the expectation for this whole winter is that storms will likely be warmer than average when they do occur, but a pretty active pattern looks quite likely right now, especially for Central and Northern California, but maybe also Southern California heading into early January. Um, and then the effects of a strong to historically strong El Nino event will likely begin to become even more noticeable as we head into January. So that's sort of my thinking right now. I may have a brief pop-up session either tomorrow or Thursday if there are real big time uh, rainfall rates and flood uh, concerns in Southern California. So th that's gonna just depend on how things evolve. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, maybe if I do that, it might be another one of the uh, satellite and radar tours that have been quite popular when I've done them during major events in the past. So stay tuned for that one. Um, so I think, uh, that just about covers it. Uh, if you're in Southern California, do be aware, this will be a significant storm and it's gonna sort of come uh, rather suddenly given how dry it's, it's been recently. So despite the warmth, despite the mugginess right now, it is coming and that's partly why the storm will be a little bit unusual and have some substantially elevated effects is precisely because of that extra moisture, mugginess and instability. Don't be too surprised if you see some thunder and lightning and some torrential downpours. Um, for some folks, that's exciting weather, so enjoy it if you can, but if you are in a flood prone area or in an area that's susceptible to debris flows, um, that is something to, p to pay close attention to uh, tomorrow uh, and Thursday. All right. Um, well, thanks, everybody. And again, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be at the Academy Museum in early January uh, for a conversation following a viewing of the movie Twister, so check out the link at the very beginning of the chat today. Uh, if you're interested, I'll embed a link into the conversation as well. Uh, and then uh, perhaps I'll see folks either tomorrow or Thursday briefly if there is some really interesting weather going on. So do, um, if you want to be notified when those happen on short notice, uh, I would suggest subscribing to this channel. I would also suggest subscribing to this channel if you want to be notified on not short notice. Well, I usually do try and share it a day or two in advance for the planned ones, but sometimes uh, for the event-driven things, the main mechanism uh, is you just need to be subscribed to get that notification. I'll post them on social media too, but you know it's easy to miss stuff like that. So, all right, uh, thank you everybody, and uh, I'll talk to you uh, next time.